If it's Monday, new fallout amid the dramatic public hearings into the January 6th insurrection as the House Select Committee prepares to lay out the next piece of its case, former President Trump's involvement in a scheme to install so-called fake electors to overturn the presidential election. Plus, lawmakers in Washington are closing in on a final deal on gun legislation with sources on Capitol Hill telling NBC News the full text of a bill could be released as early as today. We'll have the latest coming up. And Americans across the nation celebrate Juneteenth as a federal holiday for just the second time, a day marking the effective end to slavery in the U.S. What it means amid a fraught moment of racial tensions in America. That's all ahead. And welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Kristen Welker. We begin with the January 6th committee entering its third week of public hearings, laying out its case that former President Trump was at the center of the insurrection. Every day bringing new revelations from the committee and new evidence, the country remains deeply divided along partisan lines. And within the Republican Party, many are still pushing false claims the 2020 election was stolen from Texas, where Republicans declared President Biden's election illegitimate to a new campaign ad from a Missouri Republican Senate candidate, which seems to advocate political violence. We're going to get into all of it in just a moment. But first, tomorrow we expect to hear from Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and his top deputy about former President Trump's pressure campaign to overturn the results of his state's election. We'll also hear from Arizona House Speaker Rusty Bowers, who also resisted efforts to overturn the results of his state. It comes after the committee presented evidence last Last week that former President Donald Trump tried to pressure then VP Mike Pence to overturn the 2020 election results, which Mr. Trump essentially confirmed in a speech in Nashville over the weekend. Take a listen. Mike Pence had a chance to be great. He had a chance to be, frankly, historic. But Mike did not have the courage to act. But as you heard a year and a half ago, Mike Pence had absolutely no choice but to be a human conveyor belt. Here's a human conveyor belt. So I said to Mike, if you do this, you can be Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> and then after it all went down, I looked at him one day and I said, Mike, hate to say this, but you're no Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> And despite the January 6th committee's findings about the election, the Texas Republican Party continues to call President Biden's victory illegitimate, passing a resolution over the weekend that reads, quote, we reject the certified results of the 2020 presidential election, and we hold that acting President Joseph Robinette Biden Jr. was not legitimately elected by the people of the United States. Again, folks, I'm reading a quote. And as a group of Republicans continues to embrace the so-called big lie, a leading Republican candidate for Senate this this year, Missouri's Eric Greitens is embracing political violence in a new ad carrying a shotgun. He leads an armed SWAT team to storm a home, encouraging voters to join him in going after rhinos. Rhino, of course, stands for Republican in name only. The ad is not airing on TV right now, but is on the web. To get us started and to delve into all of this, I am joined by NBC's Ali Vitale on Capitol Hill. Vaughn Hilliard is in Peoria, Illinois, where Mike Pence is set to speak tonight. And Morgan Chesky is in Dallas for us. And also with me is Michael Schmidt, Washington correspondent for The New York Times. Thanks to all of you for being here and starting us off. Ali, I do want to begin with you. I know you've been working your sources on Capitol Hill, talking to folks. What are you watching for tomorrow? What can we expect from the committee? Look, Kristen, we're starting to get a better view of the broad range of ways the committee is going to try to show that former President Donald Trump and his allies put on a sustained pressure campaign at the state level, trying to pressure state legislators as well as election officials to overturn the election results or to decertify that Joe Biden had won in those states. Two of the key states that I remember you and I were covering when we were in Wilmington, Delaware in November of 2020 were Georgia and Arizona, two states that Democrats had sought to make gains in for years and, of course, finally won in 2020 with Joe Biden. Those are the two states that are going to be really on display tomorrow as if election officials from Georgia as well as Arizona testify before the January 6th committee about the ways that they stood up to a sustained pressure campaign from people like Donald Trump but also Rudy Giuliani. 
One of those people, for example, is going to be the Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. He was one of the people on that now infamous call where Trump said he just needed to find 11,780 votes, one more than what Joe Biden got in Georgia, to say that he won the state. I imagine, because this is something that we've seen over the course of several hearings, that the lawmakers leading these questions, including Adam Schiff, who's the lead lawmaker in this particular hearing, are going to do a lot to try to showcase what the former president president's mindset was, what people around him were saying, and really going at this idea of intent and motive, something that they have continuously tried to show that Trump, for example, knew that certain tactics they were trying to put into play were illegal and did them anyway, or the fact that he knew he had lost the election but continued to say he hadn't regardless of that. All of those have been shown and on display in past hearings and certainly will be at the center of what we see tomorrow when they actually get back here and do the first of two hearings this week. Yeah, in so many ways, the pressure campaign really did unfold in the states, Allie. Yeah. One of the things that we have noted at the end of each hearing, they ask people who have more information to come forward with it. And over the weekend on Meet the Press, Chuck asked Jamie Raskin about that. Of course, Representative Raskin is on the committee. Here's how he responded. Take a look. We know things this weekend that we didn't know last weekend. And things that are going to um, be important facts that we didn't even know either? Yeah, I mean, it's it's all part of a picture. But again, you know, the general story has been known for a long time. We have a president who, for whatever reason, refused to accept the results of a presidential election and then organized um, in a, in a hit against American democracy through a number of different avenues to try to overthrow the election and install himself as president. Allie, my ears perked up when I heard him say, we know things this weekend that we didn't know last week. Are you getting any new insights into what that new information might be? They are very cagey about this, perhaps understandably so. <laughs> this is a committee that wants to be the one to break its own news, and they want to do it in these hearings. That being said, we also know that they are still fact-finding in real time. At another point this weekend, Adam Schiff kind of left the door open to the possibility that they could even subpoena other key people who have not yet talked to them, including the possibility of subpoenaing the former Vice President Mike Pence. Now, he wasn't saying that definitively. He tried to couch it in saying that he didn't want to get into to the private conversations that the committee might be having. But certainly, there are key figures who remain at the center of this that the committee wants to talk to and hasn't gotten the chance to talk to yet. I would also point out, though, that Chairman Thompson told me last week they've already sent an invitation to Ginny Thomas. That's another escalation because, of course, she's the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice right now. That would show that the committee is still inviting people to come talk to them, even as they're laying out these public hearings. Yeah, it, it absolutely is a potential escalation, uh, Allie. Important to point that out. Vaughn, I want to go to you, and you've been all over the Mike Pence angle of this. As we've watched these hearings unfold, you've been reporting on the way in which he is and is not responding. He's really trying to stay focused on the future, at least publicly, as he mulls his own presidential campaign in 2024. He just spoke in Chicago. He's going to be speaking in Peoria a little bit later on today. What did he say? What do you make of his remarks? And what are you anticipating later today? Right. I think the, the struggle for the former vice president as he looks towards his own potential 2024 presidential run is what you just said, the desire of him and aides to talk about the future. And I was talking to one aide of his who said, you know, he would rather do that than relitigate the past. But I think uh, you and I got into political journalism to talk about issues and substance that impacts communities around America much more than we did in directions. But when democracy is at stake, there are some difficulties for an individual that belongs to a certain political party, let alone the one who the former president is blaming for obstructing uh, ultimately uh, what he believes should have been uh, uh, the objection to the electoral uh, slate of electors going back to states. And so I think that's where, you know, you just heard over the last 45 minutes in a speech in Chicago, the former vice president talk about the economy and American energy independence. Independence. And he gave only one quick passing reference to uh, January 6th. And I just want to read you the quote here. He said that Americans have gone through a lot over the last years, including, quote, a divisive election, a tragic day in our nation's capital. But this is a former vice president, Kristen, 
who is trying to avoid getting himself caught up into the minutia of those weeks leading up to the very contentious uh, uh, difference between him and former President Trump. You know, this is, uh, you just heard the former president right there at the beginning of the segment refer to him as a human conveyor belt who lacked, quote, courage. But, you know, for the former vice president, he sees himself as a strong partner to Donald Trump throughout the four years of the administration on the policy front, and he is hoping to have a potential outlet uh, to carry that mantle in uh, 2024. Yeah, he is walking such an incredibly fine line, Vaughn. You're absolutely right. He's really distanced himself from the former president, but at the same time talked about their policies that he's proud of. Morgan, I want to turn to you in Texas, this extraordinary development there, um, the future of the Republican Party. And of course, they signed off on a new platform there, the party claiming that President Biden was not legitimately elected. The platform criticizes the Republican gun deal negotiators. It calls home homosexuality and abnormal lifestyle choice opposes all efforts to validate transgender identity. Set the scene. What is the reaction there? Uh, certainly one of shock, depending upon who you ask, Kristen, but a, a lot of Folks here on the Republican Party would say that the handwriting has been on the wall for some time. This was the first in-person meeting for the Texas Republicans, uh, for the convention, rather, since 2018. Prior meetings canceled due to the pandemic. And so whenever they voted on this party platform, which contained dozens upon dozens of those planks, some of which you mentioned, that have now become highly scrutinized, um, this essentially was them trying to come out and put forth a public mission statement, per se, of the state of the Texas Republican Party. And now we have a very clear glimpse of where they stand. They're, they're voting on those planks. I believe the final vote has yet to come out. They're counting them up. That was taken over the weekend. But I think the fact that they merely existed in the first place uh, really shows the state of the party and, and where it stands. And so uh, right now, we saw Senator John Cornyn, whenever he took the stage there over the weekend, booed. This is a senator from Texas, elected since 2002, who essentially in front of his own constituents was jeered at for reaching across the aisle, working with Democrats, coming up with that framework of gun legislation, the most significant of which we've seen in about the last 30 years. So it was certainly interesting to see the conversations that took place in addition to uh, the presidency being deemed illegitimate uh, as a result of this uh, convention that took place over the weekend. Kristen? Yeah, great context and way to soldier on through some really loud background noise there, Morgan. Thank you for that. Um, Michael, let me turn to you now, because I know you've been doing a lot of reporting on the fallout from the hearings. And what we've seen from the hearings is that they've sort of laid out breadcrumbs, right, for a possible uh, criminal referral or criminal case against former President Trump. Ultimately, that's going to be up to the Department of Justice. There's been a big debate about whether the committee should make a criminal referral. But again, ultimately, it's up to the DOJ. What are the challenges, though, in actually moving forward with prosecuting a former president? So this week, we were able to see the committee move the ball on this question. And that happened when the committee showed that Donald Trump had been in the room and in the conversation when John Eastman, this little known outside legal prof uh, conservative law professor, uh, told the president and uh, another person who was in the room, the president's uh, vice president's lawyer who was testifying at the time, told them that the, the, the scheme that they were undertaking to essentially allow, you know, put the election in Mike Pence's hands well, had no legal basis. And because it had no legal basis, um, you know, th there, were, there were questions about whether that was the right thing to do. And in terms of proving intent, which would be an important part of a prosecution against the president, that would be a, a crucial piece of evidence because it would show that the president was told that what he was doing was wrong. Now, you can still make a case and gain a conviction without having such evidence. You can, if you head down that path, what, if you don't have that, what you could have is what's called willful blindness, proving willful blindness, proving that there were facts that Trump avoided uh, learning or accepting, you know, as he was undertaking these crimes, if he were charged, that 
show a mindset and would get a jury, get enough evidence to a jury to make a conviction. But I, what we're, you know, we've reported on this over you know the past few days. We wrote a piece about it this past weekend. Gaining a criminal conviction beyond a reasonable doubt in a courtroom where it's much more difficult to get evidence in, witnesses can be cross-examined, is just a completely different area than the area of public opinion where the where the committee is operating right now. Yeah, it's a really good point. And specifically, when you think about the political backdrop to a potential criminal uh, case against the former president, we've talked so much, Michael, about the fact that the pressure campaign really unfolded in the states. We heard that extraordinary audio tape that has been played over and over again with Mr. Trump saying to Brad Raffensperger, I just need you to find me the missing votes, basically. We've all heard him say it. What are you going to be watching for tomorrow in addition to that? Other examples that show the president undertaking um, a scheme, um, not simply just, uh, you know, to contest the election, but to contest the election in a way that that, you know, shows that he really knew that he lost, but he was doing this anyway to stay in power. Um, the audio tape is a very good example of that. It shows the president looking for a specific number of votes so he can simply win. He's not saying to Brad Raffensperger, um, look, you know, I just, you know, you know, follow the facts on the fraud, the fraud investigations. You know, it's hard to provide an example of Trump sort of giving a clean statement on that. But um, it's a it's a damning statement because obviously, uh, you know, that number of votes is the exact number that he needed uh, to put a win over the top. So any time that you can show Trump being told by people of authority, whether that's Bill Barr or the president, the vice president's lawyer at the time um, or, or West Wing aides being told, look, you lost uh, there's nothing to these claims, and um, you need to accept the reality. Those are important facts that would help prosecutors. Yeah, really fantastic reporting, as always, Michael Schmidt. Thank you, and thanks to all of you for starting us off. Ali, Vaughn, and Morgan, great conversation as we begin another big week. And still ahead, could lawmakers reach a final agreement on gun reform? Well, could happen any moment. According to our reporters there, we'll get the very latest from Capitol Hill. Plus, brand new reporting on the latest White House plan to bring down gas prices. Will it work? You're watching Meet the Press now. This threat that came in, it was mailed to my house. I, we got it a couple days ago, and it threatens to execute me, as well as my wife and five-month-old child. I've never seen or had anything like that. Uh, it was sent from the local area. Uh, I don't worry, but now that I have a wife and kids, of course, it's a little different. There are people that, uh, th there is violence in the future, I'm going to tell you. And until we get a grip on telling people the truth, we can't expect any differently. Welcome back. That was Republican Congressman and January 6th committee member Adam Kinzinger yesterday speaking about some of the threats he's experienced personally, along with his concerns about the potential for political violence in this country more broadly. Now, those warnings come, as we mentioned earlier, Republican Senate candidate Eric Greitens released an ad on the web that embraces political violence against some Republicans. To dive in more into all of this and other news today, I'm joined here on set by NBC News political analyst and former Republican Congressman Carlos Corbello, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist from the Washington Post and also an NBC News political analyst Eugene Robinson and PBS NewsHour correspondent Lisa Desjardins. Thank you all for being here. Lisa, let me let you start this off. Here you have Adam Kinzinger talking about the threats that he has received as the January 6th committee hearings have gotten underway. You have Eric Greitens who has this new ad out essentially saying, let's hunt rhinos. What does that say about the political climate that we are in as these hearings get underway? My question to sources today was, is this a new phase in mm. the rhetoric? Is this a new dangerous phase? And it's interesting because I think there are some, like Representative Kinzinger, who are saying, yes, I'm very concerned that now we're even in a worse phase of potential political violence. But what's interesting to me is some of those offices that contain so-called rhinos, people who have been targeted with this rhetoric before, tell me, this is what we've been living with. They actually don't see this as new, which is was stunning to me. But they say that it's still bad. It's been very bad. And yes, we are continuing to be worried. Eugene. Uh, it, uh, it's appalling. 
it's, mm -hmm. it's appalling that this is where our politics have have come to right now, uh, that, that that Republicans, who are, by the way, conservative Republicans, right, who are to the right of Ronald Reagan, uh, are, are called Republicans in name only simply because they do not support Donald Trump. Mm. Simply, you know, it, it, the Republican Party has become a cult of personality. That's the only way you can see it. Carlos, how concerned are you about extremism? Well, it's the reason a lot of people across the street are leaving Congress. Mm. It's the reason why some Republicans who wanted to vote for impeachment did not. It's the reason why some Republicans who wanted to vote for an independent commission to review what happened on the 6th of January did not, because they're afraid for their lives, for their families. And by the way, we've had a crescendo of... Um, you know, violent political speech, I'd say, since the end of the Bush presidency, but in came Donald Trump and said, this is okay. Do yeah. more of it. I'm going to do it as well. And uh, since then, we've just well, seen this spiral out of control. Well, and if you look at the polling around the hearings, not surprisingly, the reaction so far has sort of divided along party lines. You have just over 30 percent of Americans who seem to be tuning in. Eugene, what do you think the hearings can accomplish and should accomplish? Well, I, uh, my view of this, these hearings is that, first and foremost, they're for history. Mm -hmm. I mean, they have to get the facts and present the facts to the public. And then whatever the political implications of that are, the political impacts of that are, will just happen. Can right? there even but, be a political impact in, in this climate? Oh, or sure. does it just no, a watch? Sure there, sure there can. I mean, there, 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 there can be at the margins. Now, there are, there are the hardcore MAGA crowd that will never hear a bad word about Donald Trump. And there, there are a lot of Americans who will never hear a good word about Donald Trump. Uh, th there are a lot of people, you know, in the, in the suburbs, in the swing districts, um, who, if they're paying attention, will form opinions. Lisa? You know, I think that this committee is really trying to focus on the president's, former President Trump's role. But I think the thing that might have an impact sooner is the idea of whether the 2020 election was stolen with people who still have those doubts. Mm -hmm. I think they are ticking the dial on that one question right now. The rest of it, I agree, two, three Convincing cycles Convincing people that it wasn't. Yes, I think they're presenting very hard evidence and they are directly answering some of the most widely spread conspiracies. Well, well and the fact that the yeah. witnesses are Republicans and yeah. people very close to former President Trump, including his right. daughter and son-in-law, who are saying, yeah. no, this was not true. So right. that, I think, is having an impact. Those moments have been some of the most striking moments, they really undoubtedly. Have been. I mean, when the family came on, that was amazing. Uh, Bill yeah. Barr was particularly strong. They've been laying sort of breadcrumbs, as I was discussing in the previous segment, for the possibility of a criminal referral. DOJ saying, yeah, the, the attorney general says he's watching this very closely. Do you expect, do you think there needs to be some type of action that comes out of these hearings, Carlos? I think it would be best if DOJ acted independently, not as a result of a criminal referral. I think mm. the committee's work is to lay out all the evidence and then to preserve, preserve the integrity of the committee itself and say, no, this is, you know, we believe in the separation of powers. We're not like Donald I, Trump. We're not going to tell other I, branches I or agencies to intervene. I right? couldn't agree more. I mean, I don't think there should be a criminal referral. There doesn't have to be. The Do you think it could department. backfire, basically, is what you're saying? No, I just think it's, I think it's unnecessary, mm -hmm. and I, I frankly think it's a bad idea, because, as Carlos said, there is a separation here. This is Congress performing its duty, its legislative duty, by the way, because there is a legislative purpose to this. Uh, and justice is doing what justice is going to do. Merrick Garland's going to have a decision to make. There are, are implications, whatever. He sets a precedent president either way, yeah. that, a, that a former president can be prosecuted or that a former president cannot be prosecuted. Both of those are weighty, uh, are weighty conclusions. And of course, this all comes against the backdrop of Americans saying their number one issue is the economy, is inflation. Um, and that's their biggest concern. And there are concerns within the Democratic Party that uh, some may run the risk of overstepping and focusing too much on the January 6th committee. I want to play some sound from over the weekend, meet the press, what Larry Summers told Chuck about a potential recession. Take a look. Mostly what you need to do to reduce inflation is reduce demand. And that is a very hard process to control. And so it usually leads to a recession. The dominant probability would be that by the end of next year, 
uh, we would be seeing a recession in the American economy. President Biden says a recession is not inevitable. Lisa, has the president, based on your reporting, figured out his messaging around this issue? <laughs> well, we know Democrats have been meeting about that messaging. They yeah. are trying, the White House, Congress, they are working on it. Last week, we saw the House pass a series of bills that were trying to show we're doing something. But, you know, it's incremental things like um, new sort of inspection systems for meat and food and trying to really focus, I think, is their message on corporate America. And they're going to try to raise the idea that it's not us, it's corporate America and greed However, I think consumers don't see it that way. I think they think there's bigger issues here. Yeah, and my colleagues, Peter Alexander, Carol Lee, and I have been doing some reporting about uh, the president weighing the possibility, again, of a gas tax holiday. He says he's going to make um, a decision within the next few weeks or so. But, Eugene, even that only has a minimal impact, and it needs congressional approval, which is not something that happens overnight. Exactly. It doesn't happen overnight. It runs counter to what the president is trying to do on climate change, for example, which mm -hmm. is a huge existential issue. However, you know, the urgent can take precedence over the important. So, uh, you know, I don't know which way he's going to go on. That. Yeah. One problem he has is someone who does not like the idea of a gas tax holiday and has said so is House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, who at times is the most powerful Democrat in the country. So it, that's a a real issue. She always has had a huge influence on the White House. Carlos, Republicans who've been watching the January 6th committee hearings have consistently tweeted, many of them, most of them even, about the economy, trying to keep the focus on inflation, on these high gas prices. Um, is there a risk in that, though? I don't think so, Chris, and I think Republicans understand that the economy is their meal ticket this year and that if the focus stays on the economy, they're probably going to do well in these elections. What Democrats have to do is understand that and say we are focused on the economy and on inflation, but this here is important, too. I think for Democrats in the committee, their sobriety is their greatest strength. We haven't seen the typical showmanship that we see in a lot of these committee hearings, and I think that's why, for now, the committee is making an impact and the message is getting through. And one of the other big issues that we're watching, of course, is the debate over potentially new gun legislation, and our Capitol Hill team has been reporting on that. I want to bring in NBC's Julie Serkin, who is on Capitol Hill. She's been following the very latest on these negotiations. Julie, what are you hearing? How close are they to possibly agreeing on legislative text? Well, Kristen, as you know well, it didn't look so good at the end of last week. Senator John Cornyn left the meeting early, the meeting of the core four, when they were deciding over these two main issues they had, closing the boyfriend loophole being the main one, uh, and money for red flag grants. And he said, I'm frustrated. I'm done. It just didn't look good heading into the weekend. Fast forward to this morning, I woke up to texts from sources saying that they might have bill texts by the end of the day today, saying that things have gone in a dramatically positive direction since Thursday that last in-person meeting they had. And of course, if they have bill text by end of day today or even tomorrow when the Senate gets back, that puts them right on track to meet their goal of potentially passing this package this week before they leave town. All right, Julie, great reporting. Keep us posted. Run back to the camera if you get any new information on this. We really appreciate it. Carlos, is this a situation where Democrats basically have to say yes to whatever Republicans agree to in order to get this passed? Everyone has to understand whatever they produce today or tomorrow is a big deal. I was in Congress after the Pulse shooting in Orlando, after Las Vegas, after Parkland. We worked hard to try to get a deal. It was impossible. Whatever they're going to come up with is a big deal. Democrats should try to do more on their own, but they should celebrate this as a victory. The country needs it. And when and Democrats I talk to say they will. I mean, I, I, I believe there will be a lot of Democratic support. So that's my reporting, is that we do now expect that text today. Now, what does today mean to someone in Congress? <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. It'll be a late night. We don't August know. Exactly. Congress, right. 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 Congress right. can actually right. change right. when today know. is, because that's I remember right. doing it while You remember there. well. Right. Um, <laughs> but, but it's a great point. But to that note, Lisa, what makes this moment different? Because we've been reporting on this, as Carlos says, for years, even after Sandy Hook, mm -hmm. Congress tried and failed to get expanded mm -hmm. background checks passed. Why might this moment be different? I remember standing there in the hallway yes. in Sandy Hook when Manchin Toomey failed, and I was right next to the families from Aurora who were yeah. sobbing in the back. Right. Couldn't believe that moment slipped away. I think this is different because in a strange way, um, there's two things. There's the emotional. Congress is a little bit, feels a little bit less 
less pressure, oddly. They're more unified and more pragmatic right now about this one issue. There's also politics on both sides to what um, mm. Carlos is saying. Republicans know that right now they have what looks like a winning hand in the fall, mm. but this issue, guns, that is a problem with a group of voters they've been gaining ground with, mm. suburban women and families. Yep. They don't want to lose that ground. There is every reason for them to try and show that they understand the, that there's a problem. Yeah, it's extraordinary when you look at the polls how much support there is in both parties for changes around the edges. Majority. Great conversation on a lot of different topics. Carlos, Lisa, Eugene, thank you so much. Great to see all of you. And coming up next, as we learn more about Ginny Thomas's role in the plot to overturn the 2020 election, I'm going to talk to a Democratic congressman who's calling on her husband, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, to resign. Plus, celebrating and honoring Juneteenth as America continues to reckon with how to teach our children about the painful chapter of slavery in this country. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. As we've been saying, the January 6th committee will hold its fourth hearing tomorrow, this time focusing on the pressure campaign at the state level to overturn the 2020 elections. The committee will hear from Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger and his deputy, as well as a Georgia election worker involved in the Georgia recount. NBC has also now confirmed Arizona Speaker of the House Rusty Bowers will be testifying before the committee. Bowers was one of the 29 Arizona lawmakers that Ginny Thomas messaged after Mr. Biden won Arizona in 2020. Thomas urged Bowers and others to choose a new slate of Arizona electors. As more information comes to light about Jimmy Thomas's role in the White House's efforts to overturn the elections, New Jersey Congressman Bill Pascrell is now calling for the resignation of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. I am joined now by New Jersey Congressman Bill Pascrell. Thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it, Congressman. Christian, Kristen, you're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that so much. Well, we appreciate your joining your voice to the show today. I want to ask you, just taking a step back for a minute, back in March, some of your colleagues called for Justice Thomas to resign. But at the time, Leader Schumer, Senator Dermott, others called instead for the justice to recuse himself from the January 6th related cases. So I just want to start there and ask you, why are you calling for Justice Thomas's resignation? Isn't why isn't recusal enough? Well, if you go back over the last five years, Kristen, many people stood up and many people sat down because they didn't have the courage to move forward. Uh, you, you just heard uh, Adam speak, and I've heard Liz speak, and I've heard my brother, uh, Benny Thompson. I mean, they've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, talk is cheap. It's time for some action. I think uh, I think the justice has broken the law. When you read the law, I have the law. I know what the law is, and I'm not a lawyer. So you may have to get a lawyer to translate to you. But I think I pre understand it pretty well. Well, and Congressman, let me let me just challenge you on that point because really you're concerned sure. about the actions of his wife, not of the justice. So how do you argue that he broke the law? He would. He would say, and, and he hasn't weighed in on this, but the, the counter argument well, Mrs. is that this is about his wife, not about him. Well, Mrs. Thomas has been working on this for a very long time, before January 6th and after January 6th, as you well know, uh, it's been well publicized. This is not a political investigation into Ginny, as she wants to put it. These are Democrats are gonna say anything. We're not gonna say anything. I think that the uh, January 6th committee has done so well because they've stayed with the facts. Mm -hmm. And I think Liz and Adam have specified that and are accurate to the point. So that's what we're talking about, the law. And, we, we, and, and just to be specific, I, what's you your I proof that he to, broke the law? I just want to be specific here, Congressman. What, what proof well, do you well, have? Well, I'm read the law says any justice, judge, uh, or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality is reasonably questioned. Uh, more specifically, the, the law goes on even further to talk about the relatives that could be involved in, in this kind of a situation. She, her, her day will come, whether it's before the committee or a court, 
But there's no question she was one of the participants in the attempt to overthrow the count of the American people. As you know, and she, 62 yeah. judges, 62 judges support my position, not their position. As you know, That's the, law. the committee has now reached out to her, has signaled they may want to hear from her. Do you expect the committee to I, subpoena I her? I, I understand that uh, the uh, she will be subpoenaed. And I understand that she might even, because of what she's written before to her friend, uh, Mr. Meadows, who's, he, he can uh, ignore subpoenas all he wants. He said what he said. We have the text. He handed us the text, the you, committee that Who does. told he's you she might be subpoenaed, Congressman? Who told you she might be subpoenaed? Is that a, coming from Benny Thompson himself? No. I would never repeat what anything Benny told me about this. He's my brother, I said. Okay. But I've talked to other people, not on a committee, and then I think she's going to be subpoenaed. All right. You, you and by have, the way, yeah. how else are we going to find out the truth? You, you, have, you have said in your statement, Congressman, you have said that Clarence Thomas is a, quote, corrupt jurist. And yet, Justice Sotomayor, speaking last week at the American Constitution Society convention, she was asked about this and how she's able to work with people that she disagrees with. She mentioned that she probably has disagreed with Clarence Thomas more than any other justice, but she also said this. Take a listen. He is a man who keeps, cares deeply about the court as an institution, about the people who work there, but about people. What is your reaction wow. to that? And, and why, why not, uh, given that she says that? Again, just ask for recusal. Why ask for his resignation? Do you run the risk I, of adding to a, a politically charged climate and, uh, that's already uh, overheated? A lot of people would say. I would say, I would say to the justice, justice in good faith that Mr. Thomas cannot possibly be seen as someone who is neutral in this situation. Uh, he's voted on some things already dealing with the past election. He should have never done that. He should have recused himself because the law says that. We cannot have relatives tell, living with each other. And now, I, I don't have any right to know what their privacy, private conversations are. But she, he knew, he read in the newspaper what was going on. And he, she was working with the participants before the insurrection and after the insurrection. And if there was any reasonable possibility that the law might be broken, because he had to judge in those opinions, which he shouldn't have ever been involved in in the first place. Yeah. He's got to stay out of it. All right. So I don't care what the judge, what my friend from the Bronx says. I'm telling you, that's the law. All right. And, and Congressman, very, very quickly, before I let you go, what will you be watching for tomorrow? Oh, it gets better and better. You know why it gets better and better? Because it's the words of the people themselves. And most of them are not Democrats. Listen very carefully to what they say objectively. They were put in a tough situation. They were slyly threatened by the president of the United States, at least one of them, the secretary of state of Georgia. He had the guts to stand up. I wish some Democrats had the guts to do what they did. And we'd be in a different position right now. All right. I've had it up here with words. We need to act. All right. Congressman Bill Pascrell, thank you so much for joining us and for your perspective. I really appreciate it. to be it. with you, Kristen. All right. Thank you. Coming up next, we are live in Kyiv with the very latest from the war front in Ukraine. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. NATO Secretary General warned this weekend that the world should be prepared for the war in Ukraine to go on for years. He emphasized that whatever costs we're feeling now are nothing compared to the price the world will pay if President Putin takes control of Ukraine. Meanwhile, as the war continues to rage, we're learning more about three Americans who are missing after joining the fight in Ukraine. Videos of two of the men appeared on Russian state television Friday, confirming they had been captured. The third man has been presumed missing after his family 
family stopped hearing from him at the end of April. NBC's Ali Arusi joins us now from Kyiv, Ukraine. Ali, thank you so much for joining us. So what is the very latest on the ground there as Russia continues to press on in eastern Ukraine? Hey, Kristen. Well, the Eastern Front is very severe right now, especially in the Luhansk area. Uh, the governor of the Luhansk area said that the Russians have flooded the area with reserves, that they're battering them from the air, from the land, with missiles, rockets. Uh, and they have the advantage because they have more men, more machines, uh, more artillery. And the Ukrainians are trying to hold out. But the only area they control now is the Azot chemical plant. We had an opportunity to speak to a soldier who's fighting on the front line there. He was exhausted, but he's carrying on fighting. Let's take a listen to what he had to tell us. The fighting is very intense, and uh, uh, particularly I stayed a couple of days, a couple of weeks in Severodonetsk. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not severe, but it's very hard. Um, uh, the, a lot of artillery and mortal and uh, multiple launch rocket system shelling of the industrial area of the uh, of the city itself and he very bluntly told us like so many other ukrainians tell us that they need weapons from the west uh, without those weapons it's going to be so hard to tip the scales in their favor because of the massive advantage the russians have in this war you know they're outnumbered outgunned and, and without that they're probably going to lose that area and that will give the russians a much bigger advantage to sort of march westward because after severodonetsk and lysyshanks the terrain here becomes very flat and it will become much easier for the Russians to roll their tanks across. So this is a pivotal battle in this war. Um, Ali, let me also, as you give us the big picture, ask you about those three Americans who are missing. What are you hearing? What is the latest there? Well, again, we, we don't know about their whereabouts. Uh, the Russians haven't denied or admitted that they have these three Americans. Their videos have been circulating on Russian media. Uh, they've been playing it for the last few days. But unusually, the Russian Federation hasn't said anything about having them captive. But if indeed it is proved that they are in Russian custody, uh, then their circumstances could be very dire. I mean, look, Kristen, we know that uh, two British and a Moroccan were taken by the Russians in and, and some fierce fighting. They were hauled up in this kangaroo court in, in, in the uh, Luhansk area, and they got handed down a death sentence. So if these guys suddenly pop up in one of these uh, courts in, in these separatist areas, uh, their fate could be, could be bad, given what's happened to the rest of the foreign fighters here. Absolutely. And we have heard President Biden say over and over again, urge Americans not to go and fight in Ukraine. All right. Ali Arouzi and Kiev, thank you so much for your reporting. Please stay safe. And still ahead, America celebrates Juneteenth as we continue to reckon with a very challenging racial backdrop. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Vice President Kamala Harris stopping by a Juneteenth celebration for kids at the National Museum of African American History and Culture this afternoon. Juneteenth, officially June 19th, but celebrated federal holiday today, marks the day that the last enslaved black Americans were freed in Texas, two and a half years after President Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation. Juneteenth has been celebrated in Texas and in communities across the country for decades. President Biden officially signed it into law as a federal holiday last year. NBC Shaq Brewster joins me from Chicago as the city celebrates today. I'm also joined by Keith Mays, professor of African-American studies at the University of Minnesota. Thanks to both of you for joining me. Shaq, I want to start with you. This is the first year that Juneteenth is being widely observed as a federal holiday, even though it had been uh, announced last year. What are you seeing? in Chicago as people prepare to mark this day? 
Well, today it's a more of a formal celebration, especially here at the Field Museum, where they made uh, free entrance and they're letting people come in for free, specifically Illinois residents. And then they're also having programming uh, speakers and panels so folks can learn about the history of African Americans in this country and also the history of the Juneteenth holiday. But we're really reaching the end of what has been a lot of celebrations from coast to coast during this Juneteenth holiday week. And yesterday we saw big parades, we saw big festivals, music festivals, barbecues, especially here in Chicago, but again, all across the country. As people came out and celebrated Juneteenth, they, many of them, as I talked to them, they saw this as an opportunity to have joy, to celebrate African American culture in this country, but also acknowledge the history of the day. And one thing that you're seeing, especially in polling, is that more people understand what Juneteenth is. We saw a Gallup poll just last month show that about 60% of Americans say that they are some or have a lot of familiarity with Juneteenth. Kristen, that's up about 20 percentage points from just last year. So the fact that this is a federal holiday, the fact that there's a lot of events that you're seeing around it, yes, even the fact that it's getting commercialized in some sense, that is drawing a lot of attention to it, and it's raising the awareness about Juneteenth and sparking some real conversations among folks. Well, that's really notable, Shaq, and I think it's important to underscore that, that the recognition of it has gone up across the country. And yet, Professor Mays, I turn to you with that. 24 states and D.C. recognize it. So not every state across the country. What, have you, what do you make of that? What does that say about this moment that we're in right now? That there's still a, a, a lot of states out there, as well as a lot of people who are just unsure about uh, what it means to embrace Juneteenth as it is to embrace other black holidays. We saw the same kind of hesitation with Martin Luther King Jr. Day for so many decades, Kristen. Uh, but I think we have to continue to move forward. And what President Biden did a couple of years ago uh, was significant only because uh, it was the first time that this holiday uh, received the kind of federal recognition that many of the organizations and many of the folks who had promoted Juneteenth for, for decades, uh, if not over a century, wanted. And yes, it had become uh, widespread at the state level beginning in 1980, but it was really important to receive that federal stamp of approval uh, when uh, Biden, President Biden signed the the act into law to make it official. But I think there's still a lot of folks, Kristen, that are not comfortable with mm -hmm. Juneteenth um, uh, and they're not comfortable with, with all the other black holidays as well. That's unfortunate. Well, and you bring up Martin Luther King Day. And when I was growing up, that was a day that I spent with my mom learning about black history, celebrating it. And of course, the lesson that I learned as a child is uh, it's a day on, not a day off. How does that apply to Juneteenth? It has to be a day of remembrance. It has to be a day of commemoration. Uh, we do not want to pass uh, laws to celebrate holidays just to give people the day off. We want uh, folks to really embrace the holiday to understand why we are celebrating it. Uh, African Americans understand the importance of the holiday, but I don't think that a lot of people uh, within mainstream society, white society understand it. So we have to embrace African-American history. That's what the holiday is calling for. It's calling for, on the one hand, rem remembrance uh, of the day. What did emancipation mean to these black folks in South uh, East Texas? And what does it mean now? What did it mean in 1865? And what does it mean in, in 2022, Kristen? And I think that has to stay front and center of our, our national dialogue around race and progress. Yeah, it's an important perspective. In, in the wake of George Floyd's death, of course, there were protests across the country calling for change. This is one of the changes that happened. There were some executive actions that were passed around policing. And yet that type of sweeping reform still has not happened. Um, what do you make of where those conversations are? Has there been progress in that space? Sometimes, Kristen, I call Black Holidays low-hanging fruit because it's the bare minimum that uh, state governments and federal governments, that, you know, it's, it's, what they, it's the easy way to, to sort of uh, move progress from A to B. But what the community really wants and needs is political rights. What they need are economic rights. What they uh, need 
of the rights that are, are theirs based on the American ideals found in the U.S. Constitution and Declaration of Independence. So the mere fact that we are still debating whether we should have this holiday or that holiday is tragic in and of itself. But what is more tragic, Kristen, is that we can actually uh, think that somehow we are making progress with a particular community uh, when we just embrace a holiday, and that's not enough. There's still so much work to be done. I'm, I love holidays. I wrote a book on holidays, but I'm conflicted about them because in many ways they are, are the easiest things for us to do as a country, uh, and oftentimes we refuse to do the harder work that lies ahead of us. That's, that is, that's right before us right now, not that it lies ahead in the future. It's right before us today. All right. Well, uh, it's such an important conversation to have as the nation does pause to mark this incredibly important day. Shaq Brewster, Keith Mays, thank you so much. And thank you for being with us this hour. We will be back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. After the next January 6th hearing, NBC News Now coverage continues with Hallie Jackson right after a quick break. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.